Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's time to uh, do another webcast of answering your questions. If you go to pollgab.com slash room slash Brento, it's down in the description for the video below. You can post your questions about the Microsoft Data Platform, and then I go through and answer the most highly upvoted ones. Today I'm coming to you from uh, Beverly Hills out by Los Angeles, California because I'm waiting for a restaurant to open in about two hours. I know in my last webcast, uh, I was waiting for the breakfast restaurant to open. Now I'm waiting for the lunch restaurant to open. The whole reason that I'm here uh, for today is that my partner Eve wanted to go hit a couple of authentic Chinese restaurants in Chinatown. Uh, and today's whole game plan just revolves around those restaurants. So. So let's go ahead a couple of your uh, highly voted questions. Haydar asks, what tools do you like to use when troubleshooting Azure SQL DB query performance issues? So specifically for query performance issues, I like SP Blitz Cache, which will show you your top 10 most resource intensive queries. Um, now the catch with Azure SQL DB is that your plan cache can clear at any time. So you just have to make sure to read the priority one warnings in the second result set of SP Blitz Cache. I would tell people the same thing though on, with their on-premises uh, queries. SP Blitz Cache can also have problems when you're facing memory pressure or unparameterized queries blowing out the plan cache. So for query performance, same thing that it is with on-premises SQL servers, SP Blitz Cache. The Midnight Idol asks, does the glitz and glamour of Vegas ever wear off or get old? I'm weird in that I'm one of the few people who I would live on the uh, Vegas Strip if I could. I adore Vegas. I adore the Strip. I've looked, uh, enjoyed coming there for years. Paul Randall and Kimberly Tripp ran a conference that was in Vegas every year. And I always looked forward to going for that, for having excuses for going for Vegas. But I tell you what, I'm, I'm one of few people that I know uh, who feel that way. Almost everybody else that I know uh, can't stand the Vegas Strip after like three or four days straight there. But I love going down there all the time. Um, and I don't gamble either. So, I mean, I, I have in the past. I just don't do that now. I, I mean, I'll do it for fun, but not. I don't do it in Vegas. Hadar asks, would a Postgres version of Constant Care see, see the same demand or success? My hunch is no, because I don't think that there's as much money involved in monitoring for open source databases as there are in expensive closed source databases. Um, it, uh, those of you who manage SQL Server will know that it's sometimes a pain to get management to sign off on software that costs money. Now, um, it's much harder, it's a much bigger problem over in the open source world. People kind of expect things to be free. Uh, Walcott asks, what intelligent query processing features do you like and dislike in SQL Server 2019 and 2022? Um, I actually put a whole lot of work into one module in the Mastering Query Tuning class where I've got a whole spreadsheet laid out on a slide where I say, here's every intelligent query processing feature, here are the pros and cons of it, and here's my verdict on that feature. One of them I'll tell you, uh, scalar function inlining, I loved the idea of it. The execution just turned out to be rough. It was extremely buggy. Uh, Microsoft stopped fixing the bugs in it and they've just kind of let that feature die off by the wayside. Uh, so that's an example of one I dislike. And for the rest, you can attend my mastering query tuning class. Next up, Delete uh, asks, Good day, Brent. I'm new to data warehousing, and I was wondering what are your thoughts on using SSIS for ETL operations? I don't do any ETL work. Uh, the last data warehouse I was involved in was probably 10, 15 years ago, like that I actually worked on, as opposed to just consulted on to fix performance issues. I would be the wrong guy to ask as to what's the right tool set to use these days. 
I will say that the buzz seems to be more around serverless type products. So either Azure Data Factory, AWS Glue, um, or rolling your own ETL using things like Lambda functions, AWS Lambda. Uh, Nicholas asks, what is the largest number of tenants you've seen inside a single multi-tenant SQL Server instance? Uh, like 12 to 13,000. Did this pose, and when you say single multi-tenant, what I believe you mean is each client in its own database. Because of course I've seen way more higher numbers than that when they're all in the same database. Like one database and everybody who signs up just has rows inside that database. I've seen way hundreds of thousands, if not millions, uh, really millions I guess, because each user had their own account in one SQL Server. But if you're talking about each client gets their own database, 12 to 13,000. It says, did this pose any unique challenges? Yes. One of the things that is str uh, you struggle with there is doing backups. Another thing that you struggle with is doing uh, system startup. On system startup, SQL Server starts the uh, databases up by order of database ID. So you can have the SQL Server up fairly quickly, but only for a limited number of clients. And it can take minutes, or in worst case scenario, tens of minutes or hours before the last databases are up. Poses some uh, interesting fun challenges. I mean, there, there are other ones too. The plan cache is essentially worthless. Every query basically has option recompile in it because each database's uh, plans are cached independently. You only get like 160,000 execution plans max that you can cache. When you're dealing with 13,000 databases on one server, ain't nobody going to have anything cached, whether it's data or execution plans. Like everything's going to be pulling from storage and compiling fresh plans. Uh, Morty asks, what are your thoughts on SQL Server 22's new 2022's ledger functionality and its use cases? So the one that I've seen trotted out, the use case that I've seen trotted out involves aircraft parts. Also, just because I find the whole aircraft crashing thing really uh, intriguing. The, the FAA, Federal uh, Aviation Administration in the United States, likes to say that aircraft regulations and rules are written in blood, that when planes crash, uh, legislators try to figure out how can they make sure that this never happens again, uh, meaning that they're written in blood. So they, they want to track every part and it's uh, where it's gone on a plane, who touched it, who did maintenance on it, where was it originally built, when was it reconditioned, when was the last time it was checked for problems. Um, and you need that trail, uh, the audit trail, to be permanent and unchangeable. So it turns out the blockchain or some kind of permanent chain of custody for records is useful. Okay, so that's true, but in the year 2022, a lot of business cases that needed this already built something. So the only way that 2022's ledger functionality makes sense is if A, you're building something new from scratch, and B, you're building it on SQL Server 2022. I don't think that that's going to be a big, huge thing for most deployments out there. In addition, that change history is now permanently going to be kept inside the database. And I don't think a lot of people recognize that if you're keeping every insert, update, and delete on a table, that adds up really quickly. Uh, so it's if you think about people who are worried about growing their transaction logs out, it only gets worse when you start talking about this kind of functionality. So I don't think this is going to catch on. Not that it was meant to catch on. This isn't one of those features that everyone's going to use. It's a very small percentage of people who are going to use it. So I don't think it's something that's going to be revolutionary. Next up, my friend the DBA asks, I'm getting excited about my past summit this, this November, which is my first. Oh, cool. Uh, being a Seattle neophyte, any restaurant or food truck or personal kitchen recommendations for the trip? Yes. So uh, the past summit is hosted at the Seattle Convention Center. 
Now, I haven't been there in three years now, I guess, because of the pandemic. Uh, but a couple of my favorites, Mamnoon, M-A-M-N-O-O-N, is a vegetarian friendly place really close to the convention center. It's walking distance. It, whether you're vegetarian or not, the food's really good. Uh, so whenever I'm hosting a group of people, I like taking people there just because it's uh, an easy walk and everyone's gonna find something that they enjoy eating. I certainly do, I love their menu. Um, uh, another one that I like is really close to there. I'm going to have to pull uh, maps just to see because I don't remember what the name of the place is. Mamnoon, not Mamnoon Street, but okay, so Mamnoon, so oh, it's now called Mamnoon Street. Okay, top, just because I happen to see it, Top Pot Donuts. Uh, top Pot Donuts is quite good, and then... What's the name of this restaurant that I'm trying to find? Golly, now it may have moved. Uh, Mamnoon, you know, off the top of my head, golly, I wish I could remember what this place is. Mamnoon, and then Terra Plata. There we go. Terra Plata, T E R R A space Plata, P L A T A is a fantastic place that I like a lot. Restor the menus change all the time. Uh, is also an easy walk to from the convention center. I'm like scrolling up the map, looking along the streets. Um, and then is, there's a, a really good coffee place over there too. But those two are my favorite starting points. Next up, Nomad asks, my friend copied a database with Windows authentication using the detach and attach method. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. If you need to copy a database, restore it. Do a backup of the original and then restore the backup to a different location. This way you can keep them in sync. You can do things like transaction log shipping. You could even do database mirroring if you wanted to, but don't copy the files. He continues, the MDF and LDF file permissions were changed, yes. And reattaching the database failed, yes. Why did they change? Because you didn't do it the right way. Stop screwing around with that. Do backups and restores instead. Next up, Madiha asks, what's your opinion of the query plan viewer in Azure Data Studio? So as a, as a person who tunes queries for a living, I need to be able to right click on a plan a, a operator in a query plan and click properties. And I don't care what the mechanism is I, that I use to get that information, but I need to see an operator's properties. And for the longest time, you couldn't do that in Azure Data Studio. Within the last two, three months, they enabled it so that you could see at least most of the things that you can see in Management Studio. So that gets me closer. There's one last piece I need. The last piece I need is the ability to see execution plans in notebooks. Azure Data, Azure Data Studio has the ability to do notebooks. If I could run queries, see results, and see the plans in a notebook, then I could use it for teaching. But otherwise, Azure Data Studio is just barely getting to the point where it's feature competitive with Management Studio on plans. Why would I switch tools to get the same? Why would I not just stick with the same tool, which is the one everyone uses universally? Just stick with that one is my personal opinion. When they get execution plan support in notebooks, my story will change. Because notebooks are a wonderful tool for teaching. I'm a huge believer in that, but since I teach query performance, I Got to show plans. Uh, next up, Cronulla Stingray asks, Hi Brent, I ran SP Blitz Index and I got Indexophobia, high value missing indexes, which I created without modifications. It's been over a month and the index hasn't been used. Why is that? Well, the reason why it is, is that SP Blitz Index is just repeating whatever SQL Server says is a high value missing index. SQL Server will recommend indexes that it won't directly use. Turns out it's like, oh, it turns out that's not really useful. 
The thing to be aware of is that when SQL Server gives you a missing index recommendation, it's just a comma delimited list of columns to consider indexing. They're not in the right order. To learn about the order in which how SQL Server creates those and how you need to think about creating them instead, what you need to do with that comma delimited list and how you put them around in the right order, go watch my Fundamentals of Index Tuning class. Go to brentozar.com, click Training up at the top, and then under Classes, look at my Fundamentals of Index Tuning class. Uh, next up, Anatoly asks, how do you know if Query Store is a good or bad fit for your SQL Server 2019 Enterprise instance? Run SP Blitz Cache. In the second result set, look for Priority 1 warnings. If you have any Priority 1 warnings in the second result set, SP Blitz Cache is, or, uh, Query Store is not a good fit for that SQL Server. And you can click on the URLs, copy paste those into a web browser for those Priority 1 warnings to learn about what you need to fix first so that then you can go about using uh, Query Store successfully. Could you make Query Store work uh, despite having those priority one warnings? Yes, you're just going to have a much more hard, much more complex journey. Uh, whereas if you don't have priority one warnings, it's going to work pretty well out of the box. And then finally, Anatoly also asks, what are the risks of long running native SQL backups? For me, long running restores. If you think the backup's long to, or taking a long time to run, just wait until you have the CIO tapping you on your shoulder going, is the restore done yet? Is the restore done yet? Because right now the CIO ain't tapping you on your shoulder asking you if the backup's done yet. You better believe they will be tapping you on the shoulder asking about the length of the restore time. There are other risks as well, but that's the one that just blows me away that people don't think about when if the, if the backup takes six hours, and have you ever thought about the restore will take six hours, and just ask the business, are you okay being down six hours uh, during a restore? And that guarantee you the answer is going to be no. All right, well that is the end of the upvoted questions there. I will go ahead and clear out the poll gab queue so that people can uh, put in new questions and upvote them. If you have a question you'd like to see me discuss during office hours, put it in on the link below in the video description and uh, enjoy your, I was gonna say weekend just cause it's my weekend, but it may not be yours. So whatever, I'll talk to y'all at the next office hours. Adios.